Good morning. If you would please open scripture with me to Matthew chapter 5. Our text today is going to come from Matthew chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 27 through 30. So if you please follow along as I read to you these verses. This is the Lord speaking. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I'm fully aware that by the Lord's uh, call and kindness, um, our church is made up of people of all ages, and that includes children. Um, They are as much a part of the church as anybody else, and I know that today is an extremely sensitive subject, and so I'm going to do my best with God's help to be as clear, as faithful to the text, and as sensitive to the mixed company as possible. So there you are. (laughs) So um, scripture stories are recorded for us uh, for a reason. Ultimately, all of them point us forward to the Savior that every story in scripture calls for, and they also show us the consequences of sin in the lives of real people in real history, people who loved the Lord and followed after him and still stumbled in many ways. One of them is King David. And in 2 Samuel 11, we're told that King David stays home one spring when other kings were going out to war, and that sets you up for the idea that something might be going on that shouldn't be. And he did. He, he put himself in a compromising situation. He was walking around his uh, his, uh, his house one day out on the balcony or whatever, um, no problem. And he happened to come upon a gorgeous young woman who was bathing somewhere below the palace grounds. And he had no clue that she was going to be outside on her property taking a bath. And he found himself at a moment of decision. What would he do? Would he immediately look away without sinning, go inside and be with his family, or would he continue to entertain the gaze and lust after her? Well, we know what happened. He lingered. And that second look in that moment turned into a cascade of events that included adultery, deceit, murder, the death of an innocent child, and ultimately the destruction of his family. And while he repented and turned once again to the Lord in whom he trusted and found forgiveness, if you notice, everything after 2 Samuel 11 all the way through the end of David's life is a bad to worse situation, and it all stemmed from that decision to go and take a second look. And today, as we press on in the Sermon on the Mount, we see again that Jesus doesn't shy away from sensitive subjects. Rather, he insists on applying the gospel to every part of his people's lives, including the most sensitive parts. And remember, he's showing here in the rest of chapter 5, the section that we're in, what true righteousness looks like in his people, in contrast to the false righteousness, the skin-deep righteousness, the surface-level righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. And today what Jesus shows us is what true sexual righteousness looks like. And so we'll start where Jesus does by considering the seventh commandment, which is found in Exodus 20, 13 and Deuteronomy 5, verse 18. Jesus quotes that commandment here in verse 27. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery is sin, but we knew that. Specifically, Adultery is a married person having intimate relations with someone who's not their spouse. It's a married person's sin. An unbiblical society like ours waters down the impact of it by finding other words for sin, like affair. But Jesus uses the term adultery, and so should we. It packs a punch. Sexual infidelity in a marriage is adulterous, and God forbids it, which is to say that on the positive side, he commands covenant-keeping faithfulness between a husband and a wife. Well, let's see why. Why does he go there? Why does he command covenant faithfulness? 
We're going to spend the entire morning next Sunday looking at marriage because unless we understand what Jesus thinks about marriage, we cannot understand why he goes where he does with divorce and remarriage, which is the next section in the Sermon on the Mount. So I won't spend too much time considering marriage here this morning. We'll do that next week. But for a brief moment, let's consider what's going on in a marriage. Well, at creation, Adam was formed by God and placed in the garden to to do two things, to work it and to keep it. So to cultivate it and to protect it. And those same two things are what we're charged to continue doing in our lives. And then he formed Eve as a helper for Adam as he does his task. And he put them together in the covenant of marriage and gave them a blessing, the blessing of an intimate relationship as a seal on that covenant. And he blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, spread God's glory throughout it, in other words. And Paul looks back to that and specifically quoting from Genesis 2, he says to the Ephesians, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And then Paul gets right to the heart of what that was about. And he says, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. As one author summed it up, marriage is a covenant union that's sealed with a sexual relationship. And this relationship is intended to produce children who will fill the earth for the glory of God. And it's so intimate, it's so sacred, that what Paul says is that it's actually an arrow that's pointing beyond itself to Jesus and his church. The love he has for them and redeeming them, and the love that they have for him and submitting to, following, and cherishing him. In all its fullness, marriage is to be a living watercolor of the gospel. Enter adultery. When one spouse steps outside the covenant union and joins with another person, a number of things happen all at once. First, the covenant is broken. In Proverbs 2, verse 17 and 18, it says that the adulteress forgets the covenant of her God and leads her house to death. Another thing is that the innocent spouse is sinned against in the most profound and trust-shattering way. And if the person on the other end of the adultery is also married, then her husband is also sinned against, or his wife, because his spouse has been stolen by another person. And where Christians are called and commanded to love their neighbors as themselves, that Christian love is abandoned in favor of selfish passion. And adultery devastates children, especially if it leads to divorce. Adultery also, and this is where it never stays in private, adultery erodes the foundations of society because the family, beginning with marriage, is the first institution that God ever created before he said uh, he gave the government, before he gave the church, he gave the family. And And the family is the foundation of society. And so whatever chips away at that, chips away at everything. And finally, adultery robs the adulterer. If the adulterer is, in fact, a Christian, the adultery robs the adulterer of the assurance of salvation because that person can no longer look at their life and say that they are behaving in any way that's distinguishable from an unbeliever. These are some of the reasons that Jesus says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, adultery is oftentimes understood to be simply the act of sleeping with someone other than your spouse. And that's certainly how the scribes and the Pharisees understood it, which is why their righteousness went only skin deep. Because as long as they weren't physically intimate with someone other than their wife, they considered themselves to be righteous. But Jesus takes us straight to the heart of adultery, which is what God's commandment is really about. And he says in verse 28, and again, he's not contradicting God's command in the Old Testament. He's showing what it's all about. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus locates adultery in the heart before the body ever gets involved, if the body ever gets involved at all. And one of the ways that the scribes misunderstood the seventh commandment was to read it in isolation from the tenth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Coveting is a heart matter. And Jesus says in the Beatitudes that his people are pure in heart and they shall see God. 
And as we saw when we looked at that beatitude, the heart is our inner self. It is the most central uh, part of who we are. Proverbs calls it the wellspring of life. Everything flows from it. The biblical writers understood the heart to be the center of your motives and of your desires, of your intentions, your emotions, and often the Bible gives special emphasis to the heart being the center of your thoughts. And so Jesus says it's from the heart that murder and adultery and sexual immorality and all kinds of evil come. So so Jesus has the heart in plain view, and he says that everyone who looks lustfully at a woman has already committed adultery with her in the deepest part of who he is. So we ask, what does it mean to look with lustful intent? What is Jesus talking about here? Because sometimes this is misunderstood. Well, if you'll see in verse 28, the word looks, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, If you are into grammar or that kind of a thing, you'll notice that this is a verb that's in the present tense in the active voice. And basically all that means is that this is an intentional gaze. It's an intentional gaze fueled by a desire to be with that person in an intimate way. This is more than a passing glance. It's more than simply noticing that somebody else is attractive. This is an intentional gaze fueled by a heart that desires to be with that person. Renowned commentator John Stott says, we all know the difference between lusting and looking. We all know the difference between lusting and looking. So it's not just being aware that someone is attractive. It's not even David on the roof seeing Bathsheba for the first time. No. It's fixing the thoughts on that person and letting the imagination have free reign. It's David staying on the roof, looking again, instead of taking his thoughts captive. And don't just think that because Jesus uses the term adultery here that he's only focusing on married people as if unmarried people who do this kind of a thing have a free pass. No, it's obvious that when he says everyone who looks at a woman, not just a wife, but a woman with lustful intent, he's pointing out that this is talking about sexual sin all on the whole, all of it. It's all included here. He has in mind sexual immorality, period, married or unmarried. And he's pulling back the curtain on the command against adultery. And as with everything in the Christian life, this goes all the way down. To entertain the desire and imagination for someone who's not your spouse, even if it's in the privacy of your own thoughts, is the heart of adultery. And it's not just men. It's not just men that Jesus is targeting here either. God created men and women, and part of that very good creation was the gift of sexual desire. And that desire is to be given free, full reign to the glory of God within the covenant of marriage. And it's a desire that's given to both men and women. And while it's true that men are more visually tempted than women are, Jesus hardly means that a man entertaining desires for someone else is sinful while a woman entertaining desires for a man is not. No, for both men and women, feeding the God-given gift of imagination, okay, and that is a God-given gift, to feed the God-given gift of imagination with desire for someone other than your spouse is sin, period. That's the heart of the seventh commandment. That's what it means. Well, since the 1960s, the world, especially the Western world, has been gripped by the sexual revolution. And this revolution, as all revolutions do, throws off the constraints of what has traditionally been understood as normal biblical morality. It's been sweeping along since then, and it is not slowing down. And here's the thing. It's not as if adultery and sexual immorality haven't always been part of human history. But what the revolution does is it brings what used to be kept in the dark out into the streets and it celebrates it, especially in the month of June. And this revolution included the widespread use of the pill and other chemical birth control and it normalized premarital and extramarital intimacy. What quickly followed, no wonder, was legalized abortion. And the pornography industry skyrocketed. And what we're seeing now with the LGBTQIA XYZ plus movement is simply the latest manifestation of that. And the tide rolls on. And thankfully, by God's grace, faithful biblical churches, okay, and I do use those two words specifically, faithful biblical churches, 
are not bowing the knee to the latest onslaught, but are continuing to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that sexual activity is righteous only within the bounds of a marriage between a biological man and a biological woman. However, Christians in those same faithful biblical churches falter in Jesus' teaching here about adultery. We may find ourselves on the biblical side of the revolution, but how many of us steal a lustful glance when we find someone else attractive? What does Jesus say? This is the heart of adultery. How many find themselves in compromising situations in front of the television because of a foolish choice of entertainment? How many Christian men or women use pornography lustfully treating God's image bearers as objects to be feasted upon by the mind and the eyes. And tragically, countless pastoral ministries have made shipwreck on these very rocks. Lord, help us. Now, the sexual revolution has made it easier than ever to indulge lust, and the tide is not turning. It's getting worse, and the church had better be ready because it's going to hit us with all of its legal force. But that's not, what most, that's not what's most important here. What's most important here is for us to have a biblical response to the revolution. And the response to the revolution is not a counter-revolution. We don't need another revolution. What we need is a sexual reformation, a truly biblical sexuality that brings the world up short by showing how good God is and how perfect his design. We can get on board with that. And for followers of Christ, there's no other way. Because if we take Jesus seriously here, we have to insist on the kind of reformation that shines the glory of Christ into a world of sexual darkness and brokenness. The toll has been incalculable. The tragedy has destroyed lives. But listen closely because Jesus shows us how to have this reformation and it begins with each of us. The psalmist asks, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it, according to your word. So here, we're going to look at nine biblical truths from God's word that will keep our way pure. Each one of them is worth its own sermon. And yet, we have a lot of Sermon on the Mount to cover, and so I'm going to give them to you in summary, and you can lay them before the Lord, meditate on them, pray about them, and even more, with God's help, do them, okay? I will only take a little bit on each one if you will commit to do them. Otherwise, I'm doing like nine more sermons on this. (laughs) So let's jump in. Let's see what God has for us here. First, If you would have a sexual reformation and shine the glory of God in sexual brokenness, then realize the cost of lust. Realize the cost of lust. Look with me at verses 29 and 30 and see what Jesus says. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Jesus has been talking to us about adultery, and he shows here what the cost of adultery is if it's not dealt with. And the cost is hell. Eternal condemnation from the Holy One who is just. The wages of sin is what? It's death. In Leviticus 20 and verse 10, listen to what the civil penalty in Israel was for adultery. It says, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now, the Israelites who were listening to the Sermon on the Mount for the first time would have had that in mind. But Jesus says, hey, this isn't just physical death we're talking about. It goes far beyond that. This is eternal death in hell. This is because someone who's been saved by the amazing grace of God. Now, he's he's talking to whom in the Sermon on the Mount again? He's talking to his disciples, and he's saying that for his disciples, they cannot be committing adultery because someone who's been saved by the amazing grace of God in the gospel cannot live in unrepentant sin. It cannot live in unrepentant sin, whether that's via pornography or lustful imagination let loose or an adulterous relationship physically. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians. He's about as clear as he could be here, and it's not easy to read, but it's true. 
Okay, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Somebody whose life is characterized by those things, who are not making war on their sin, but are giving themselves over to it, that person will not inherit the kingdom of God. The cost of unrepentant lust will be eternal death in hell. Now hear me clearly, what I'm not saying is that if you're truly battling and you fall, that you're not saved. That's not what's being said. If you're truly battling and, you're fa and you fall, Jesus is not saying you aren't saved. What he is saying is that if you're enslaved and are not taking your sin seriously, it means that you were probably never in Christ to begin with. But listen, there was a death penalty that was paid for your adultery and mine. And it was paid by the sinless son of God so that he could purchase a spotless bride. And so don't just count the cost of adultery to you. Count the cost of adultery to the Holy One who died in your place and rose again so that you would be free. So that your lust could be put to death and you might live. That's what the cost of adultery was to the Holy One. So that we might not bear the cost of adultery and in fact we might flee from it to Christ and find forgiveness full and free and never pay the penalty of our sins. Amen? That is the gospel. Well, second, repent of your sexual sins. Because of what Jesus is saying here and because of what Jesus has done for us, repent of your sexual sins. If Jesus died for you, then come to him in repentant faith. To repent, again, it means to turn away from sin and forsake it. It's to have a relationship of hostility to it where before we had a relationship of love. It's to make war on it. It's to hate it. And if you find yourself in a raging battle for your soul over sin and you wonder if you can escape, friends, the joyful answer is yes. Yes and amen. And what is every yes and amen found in? Jesus Christ. There is freedom. See, just in the very next verse, after Paul tells the Corinthians that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, this is what he says. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. <laughs> you were washed. You are free in Christ. And so this very moment, if you find yourself dealing with sexual sin, turn away from it and say farewell because Jesus put it to death. He's talking about repentance when he talks about tearing out your right eye or cutting off your right hand if you're giving those things occasion for sin. He's saying, turn away from sin, whatever the cost. And he's not saying these things, by the way, to condemn you. He's saying these things to draw you in repentance to himself. Jesus doesn't convict his people to condemn them, but to pour grace on them. So whatever it takes, turn to Christ by faith and leave your sin at the cross, because that's where it's nailed. And third, recognize that if you are in Christ, you are dead to sin. There's no, this isn't open for interpretation. You are dead to sin. Sin will have no more power over you. One of the most fatal flaws for Christians who keep falling into enslaving sin, whether that be with alcohol or pornography or you fill in the blank, if anything is enslaving you at all, one of the most fatal flaws is to not consider yourself dead to those things. As long as we entertain the possibility of sin, we will sin. Okay, if you entertain the possibility of sin, you will sin. But listen to what Paul says in Romans. For the death of, that Christ died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So, so because what? Because Jesus died, okay? You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as instruments for unrighteousness, but present your members to, to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Your members as, as instruments of righteousness. 
See, Christian men who struggle with pornography will often have some kind of accountability software that blocks bad websites and sends reports to an accountability partner, and that's all fine, and that's, that's good for what it is, but it doesn't do a thing to change the heart. Nobody was ever transformed into the image of Jesus from external software, okay? God gets into the hardware of your soul. That's where he does his work. If a man considers himself dead to lust, he could be minding his own business online and then get sucked into a tornado of pop-up windows, and he's going to shut that computer right away, go to his wife and say, hey, can you go clear the screen so I can keep working? That's what a man considering himself dead to sin will do. He won't sit there and go, oh, no, what should I do? I can be strong, and that's, you're dead. You're dead at that point. Consider yourself dead to sin. And next, And this gets to the heart of verse 29 and 30. Radically rid yourself of your pitfalls. Radically rid yourself of your pitfalls. That's what Jesus means when he says to maim the eye or the hand. He doesn't actually want a bunch of people walking around with one hand and one eye. Okay, And there have been some, especially in earlier church history, that have done that. One church father castrated himself in response to this verse, and then later admitted that it hadn't solved the problem, and he may have misunderstood Jesus. That's a really bad time to realize that you misunderstood Jesus. You know? <laughs> Jesus would not have you cut your eye out or cut off your hand because your eye and your hand have never caused you to sin, not once. You've only used your eye and your hand to sin. It always came from your heart, and you can't cut that out. But what you can do is cut out all the places in your life where you get into trouble. Some women can't read romantic novels or watch certain movies without fantasizing. And Jesus says, if that's you, it's better to never read those or watch again than to go to hell. And by the way, Fifty Shades of Grey isn't grey at all. It's literary porn. Some men can't have internet access on their phone or computer or television without sinning. And if that's you, Jesus says, it's better to get a dumb phone and cut off your internet than to go to hell. The choice is yours. Heart adultery may begin with a second look of the eye, and it may progress to taking action with the hand, but the heart will always be the blame. And that's why radically ridding yourself of your pitfalls looks like getting rid of whatever it is that's your stumbling block into sin time after time. And if you get into trouble just by walking around and and having eyes, then treat yourself like you didn't. Don't do the things that your eyes would do if given free reign. The most radical thing you can do, though, is not to cut off an eye or a hand, but to cut off the sin from your heart by treasuring Jesus more than your sin. This is what Jesus is saying to us, the same as he said to Israel. In Deuteronomy, just before they went into the promised land, listen to this, the Lord God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live Don't circumcise your hand, circumcise your heart. Turn to the Lord and find out that he is better. Radically rid yourself of your pitfalls. And then resolve not to sin sexually. Okay, a circumcised heart that loves the Lord will also be a heart that resolves not to sin sexually. If you consider yourself dead to sin, you will resolve not to sin. Now, to remind us, being resolved to do something means to be firmly and resolutely set toward that thing. It's not that a a passing wind of temptation or whatever the case may be isn't going to blow you off course. You are resolved. Jesus was resolved to go up to Jerusalem. He set his face like a flint, it says, and he went up to die for our sins. Job was the most righteous man of his day, and he was wholeheartedly in love with the Lord, and he resolved to keep his heart pure the way that Jesus is talking about here. Listen to what Job says in the middle of his suffering as he's looking on his life just to figure out, what have I done that could cause me so much suffering? Could it be my integrity? And then he says this. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? He had covenanted with his eyes not to go where his heart had no business going. He was faithful to his wife. Go and do likewise. And run from temptation. Run from temptation. If you haven't noticed by now, friends, we cannot evade temptation. Like, it's going to come. Kid, like, you don't even need to. You could be in a solitary confinement cell. Temptation's going to find you. 
especially in the pornographic and immodest culture we live in. It's all around us all the time. But by God's grace, we can train ourselves to run from temptation when it comes. And this is what Rick read to us from 1 Corinthians earlier. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee is like, a, if you put that on the running spectrum, that's like more of the sprinting kind of a run. Not the plod, like, oh no, I'm trying to get away. Perhaps he had in mind Joseph when he said that. That righteous man who was wrongly enslaved in Egypt, he devoted himself to his work, even though he had been wrongly put there. He honored the Lord in his situation. But his master's wife was an adulterous woman, and she tried to entice him every single day. And every single day, he said no. He considered himself dead to sin, so he didn't think about what it would be like to be with her. He didn't even consider it a possibility. He said no, and then he went and he did his thing for the glory of God. And then we're told about what happened next. But one day when he went inside the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. That's a godly game plan. Leave the garment and go. Preferably be wearing something because you will be pulled over. If you fall into sin when you're by yourself, don't be by yourself. Okay, pick up the phone, call a close believing friend when you're tempted, run from temptation, because better never to be alone in your house than to be thrown into hell. Well, the very first blessing that God ever gave humanity, it was a marriage blessing, like we saw earlier. He said to be fruitful and multiply. So it's no wonder then that one of the most powerful ways to prevent heart adultery is to rejoice in your spouse if you're married. Rejoice in your spouse. And I know this doesn't apply to everyone, but it will apply to most people at some point. And this is precisely what Solomon says to his son in cautioning him against the destructiveness of adultery. It was what was read earlier to us from Proverbs 5. Solomon, he's not giving suggestions here. These are biblical commands. He says, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad? Streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. This, this is the picture of covenant exclusive faithfulness, okay? Let, her fa- let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always with her love. By the way, friends, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a church culture where this idea of a honeymoon period um, was put off as normal. Just, okay, well, you're newly married. Expect everything to die down, and then you just need to be faithful to each other. Don't, don't expect a lot of passion, but just stay, stay till the end, and you will be blessed. I, I just don't read that here in the text. I don't read that in Song of Solomon. I see a command to be chasing after your spouse. The, the word intoxicated is there for a reason. Why, he says, should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Now, who's watching? The Lord's watching. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. Do you see the power and the passion of that? God wrote this, okay? This isn't just Solomon, and it certainly isn't me. This is God's words. The Bible is not boring. We're told that taking delight in our spouse is one of the most powerful weapons against adultery. So if you would study your spouse, talk with your spouse about more than just the schedule. Reconcile with your spouse the things that have caused bitterness for years. Seek help if you need to, but go with your spouse, reading scripture with your spouse. If you do that, then you won't be studying and spending time with and thinking about other people's spouses. And what Solomon is saying here and what Paul's gonna say later in 1 Corinthians 7 is that as a general rule, Both spouses should be intimately available to each other because that's the only sanctified outlet for this kind of a thing, and that's by God's design. And in case, I have to say this, in case it doesn't go without saying, this is not an excuse for a husband to be a bonehead and to demand what he wants of his wife and to ignore her except when he wants her. That's not not what Paul is saying here. It's not what Solomon's saying. It's not what scripture ever teaches. 
It's not a license for either spouse to insist on their way whenever they want. It's an exhortation to love one another, to sacrifice for one another, to put one another first because Jesus is king of that marriage and to enjoy each other regularly, all within the context of a gracious covenantal relationship. If you would guard yourself from hard adultery and you're married, then rejoice in your spouse and ask for help if you need but don't ignore this command. Sexual reformation only happens also when believers relate honorably to each other. Relate honorably to others. As I said earlier, I fully realize and appreciate the fact that not everyone is married and some people won't be. Some people were and aren't anymore, okay? The church is as much made up of those people as anybody else And far from what sometimes gets subtly communicated in Christian circles, singleness is not any kind of a lesser Christianity. In fact, Paul says there are some serious benefits there for the kingdom of God that aren't true of of those who are married. He speaks of it very highly, and so should we. Even as he recognizes that it's not going to be the permanent norm for most people. But the pastor theologian James Montgomery Boyce He rightly points out that the intimate relationship in marriage is only one facet of the deep Christian fellowship that a Christian marriage is supposed to have. Many aspects of fellowship which are to be shared among the body of Christ. Most Christian fellowship friends and Christian encouragement and edification happens outside of marriage. Every believer has a part to play in building up the saints both older men and younger men, or and older women, younger boys uh, and girls, young men, young women, everybody has a, 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 an essential part to play here. And so Paul tells Timothy, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, what? In all purity. Act with someone who's not your spouse as though they are a brother or sister, because in Christ they are. In our interactions with each other, it's a matter of life or death that we guard one another's purity. And that means not treating another person as if you're married to them, even, hear me now, parents, this is a super helpful guide for you with your older children, even if you're dating them. If you're in a dating relationship, don't treat the person as if you're married to them. Guard what belongs to your spouse at all costs. As Beyonce says, if you like it, put a ring on it. Okay? But until you do, take note of what God says. This is, she's not a theologian, by the way. (laughs) This is the will of God. He says, your sanctification. And what is the sanctification that he's specifically talking about? That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. And finally, friends, and this, and this really is the most important thing, and if you take nothing else away, take this away. Rest in the goodness of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Rest in the goodness of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Young people and single people, biblically um, and lawfully divorced people, and widows may very much desire to be married and have the kind of relationship that Solomon describes. Some are facing very real temptations without the opportunity to find fulfillment in a Christian marriage. This is important to know. God is not caught off guard by your situation. And his sovereign goodness, his sufficiency, and his promises abound to you no matter what your situation is. He promises that no temptation will overcome you that's too much for you to bear by his grace. When did Potiphar's wife come to Joseph and he continued to resist? It was when he was single. He would get married later. It was when he was single. Jesus says his power is sufficient for us in our weakness. So take heart. And in Romans 8.13, he says that by the Spirit, you can put to death the deeds of the body and live in holiness. And so it really is true what we sing. Because of his great love, we are not overcome, whether we're married or not. And so we must chase after Christ, resting in his goodness to us and the power of his spirit in us. We take seriously what Jesus says about true righteousness here that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. 
And in a nutshell, what Jesus is saying, he's saying that lust is heart adultery and leads to hell. So leave lust and love Jesus. If you do that with God's grace, then you will be more satisfied than you ever thought possible. This marriage thing and all that goes with it are are temporary things of this earth that are given as a gift to point to a greater reality. Jesus is coming. In him, we are the bride of Christ. We will enjoy unbroken fellowship, intimacy, and communion with him forever. So let's keep our eyes there, and that will sanctify everything here. Well, one of the the ways that we see the goodness of Christ the most is in the Lord's Supper. It's here at the table that we gaze on Christ by faith and receive all that he is for us in the gospel. And so when we receive these elements of bread and juice as he commanded, he nourishes our soul and testifies to us of his goodness, of his saving love. We look back to his accomplished work on the cross and forward to his coming. We proclaim it until he comes. I have to commend you for coming back to church after the sermon on anger last week. <laughs> I had to show up because I was preaching, but it, it, was, it was deep for me as well. And so if you are weary and convicted of sin, come to the table. Confess your sins to the Lord and trust in his blood. Turn to him by faith and realize he is sufficient for you and come with thanksgiving. Our confession of sin is but a small part of our robust relationship with Jesus, a relationship that, that is saturated with his love. So take heart and rejoice. But if you're here this morning and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone, if you don't know that you are one of his, then we would ask you in accordance with God's word to stay where you are this morning. Come talk with someone after the service if you're desiring to know what it means to follow Christ. We will gladly introduce you to the Savior. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, the words of institution. And and while I am, if elders who are serving, if you would come forward and prepare to serve the supper, I'd appreciate it. Beginning in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please join me in prayer. Oh, gracious Savior, You have exposed our hearts and our desperate need for you. And we praise you that you have not done so in order to condemn, but in order that we might know where to find your salvation and your grace and your power and your aid. Your goodness abounds, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. And as we come to your table now, we do so with the thankful, joyful expectation that your promises are true including your promise to to nourish and keep us for all time because you have made an end of our sins at the cross. And so, Lord, as we come, please meet us here. Nourish us here. Make us into your image here. And as we go from the table today, may we do so in the new strength, the renewed strength that only you provide. Thank you for your body broken for us, your blood poured out for us. May we eat and drink with thankful hearts by faith. In your name we pray, amen.